Welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to the debate part of the evening. If you'd like to take part in this discussion, well, it's not debate, it's a discussion, really, because um, we have lots of people who broadly agree with each other. But what we're going to do is try and take, um, take, take the discussion on from where the film has left off and talk a little bit about how you implement it, how you do it, is it politically achievable, uh, what would be the obstacles, what would be the effects. Be before I introduce the panel, uh, we, we've got lots of eminent people in the, in, the, in the audience with us as well, and I want to hear from you a little later on. But actually, uh, R Richard suggested, and I think it's a good one, that um, we maybe kick off with a brief reaction from one of our guests uh, in the audience. Where, where are the roving microphones? Who are the people that, right, could you bring one down, right down to the front here? Because the Colombian ambassador uh, is, is with us uh, in the room. And ambassador, thank you very much for joining us today. I wonder what your instant reaction is to the film. Thank you very much. Uh, congratulations to Sam, uh, to Sir Richard, uh, to the uh, people that have made possible this uh, excellent contribution to uh, improve the uh, debate about what to do with uh, this uh, huge problem, the failure of the uh, war on drugs. This uh, problem has uh, cost uh, Colombia and many other Latin American countries many uh, hundreds of thousands of lives and uh, billions of dollars wasted, money that should have been invested in schools and hospitals for our deprived communities have been misspent in this, uh, in this uh, stupid and immoral war that has been a, a huge failure. So I think that the uh, documentary is a, a wonderful contribution to opening the minds and the hearts of the leaders of the world and to uh, inspire and persuade and motivate the ordinary citizens to challenge the status quo and to uh, break the taboo and find the different alternatives. As President Santos from Colombia has said they repeatedly, we want to look into uh, new options based on evidence led by experts, by scientists who know how to deal with uh, better ways uh, to, to uh, deal with the uh, supply and demand uh, for drugs. So on behalf of, uh, of uh, President Santos of Colombia, of uh, 46 million Colombians that have suffered from this nightmare of this uh, uh, war on drugs, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we want now that other countries in the world do not suffer what we suffered during many years. Colombia has made a lot of progress, but unfortunately the problem of production and traffic is moving to other nations in Latin America and in West Africa. So we need to make sure that nobody suffers as we suffered, and that this is the, the way to go forward. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. First thing to remind you, if you want to join the discussion on Twitter or get the discussion going on Twitter, the hashtag is Break the Taboo. It's on the screens uh, for some of you to see. Uh, so you use that, and I'll, I'll try and keep across it as well um, and bring it in wherever relevant to the discussion. Well, on the, on the panel, um, let me introduce, starting at the end, Danny Kushlik uh, founded Transform Drug Policy Foundation in 1997 after working in a variety of jobs, jobs in the drugs field. It was his client's experience that led him to the understanding that prohibition is a social policy catastrophe. He believes the war on drugs could be over by 2020. Uh, next to Danny, Tom Lloyd was a police officer for over 30 years before retiring as Chief Constable of Cambridge Constabulary in 2005. Now, his first-hand knowledge of the war on drugs uh, led him to the conclusion that, was, that it was, in fact, a war on people and has been very expensive and a counterproductive failure. Caroline Lucas is the MP for Brighton Pavilion and an active member of Parliament's all-party group for drug policy reform. Uh, she supports what she calls an evidence-based approach to drug policy and believes there's a strong case for the decriminalisation uh, of personal drug use, as the current punitive approach doesn't effectively address the problems. 
Uh, next to Caroline, of course, uh, Richard doesn't need any in introduction, so I won't do anything. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and next to, next to Richard, uh, also who you'll have seen on the film, of course, uh, Amanda Fielding, the founder and director of the Beckley Foundation, which is a charity dedicated to reforming global drug policy uh, based on health, harm reduction, cost effectiveness and human rights. Let, let's, let's begin uh, by saying, well, how would we do it in Britain? given that we are in, in Britain. Uh, Danny, would it, would it just happen? Uh, Suppose you got the political backing. Well, the first thing is it's already happening. I, I, we, the, the danger is, and I think that, that, that one of the ways that the, the, the debate pans out is that we see prohibition as the norm and legalisation and regulation as radical. It's actually the other way round. The way that we normally deal with adult risk-taking behaviours is to regulate them. We don't ban them. And it's actually the ban that is the radical move, and that's why we've created all this trouble with it. So we have basically four ways of dealing with drugs. One is to prohibit them, which is basically gifting it to the mafia. To let, let, let's not go over all the, the, but, the arguments we've seen okay, in the film. The, I mean, I, I want to get straight into practice. Well, then the three, the three other ways are to prescribe uh, by doctors to sell it from pharmacies or dispense from pharmacies and to sell it under license. We know how to do that. Half of the world's opium is grown for the licit... Uh, opiates market for, co for, for, for the things that you buy over the counter and the things that you get prescribed um, when you've got uh, severe pain or chronic pain on pe people who are dying of cancer. Use opiates. Uh, you can go and see 8,500 hectares of opium growing in the UK for the medical opiates market. It's already being done so that there isn't anything new that has to be done here. All we have to do is expand those, those um, modes of, of producing and supplying drugs to account for the currently legal, legal um, market, so that we take that market away from, from paramilitaries, from organized criminals and unregulated dealers, and, and give it back to, to the control of governments and states, um, commercial enterprises, and, and, and where it's appropriate, state monopolies. It's actually very simple. Tom, how long do you believe it would take uh, if you did that, and if you just massively expanded a regulated drugs market? <clears throat> Uh, for it to have a, a really big impact on the, 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 the criminal element of drug supply? Well, I think it'll take some time, and I think there's a complexity around this, which is that if you look at uh, parallels perhaps with um, terrorist organisations, that I think the way forward is probably going to actually be to work with some of these cartels in the way that this was never admitted by politicians in dealing with terrorist organizations, but behind the scenes they were talking. So even though that may feel like anathema to, um, to many people, you've probably got to engage with the people who are currently in charge of the production and supply in the first instance, because they've got big organizations set up to produce, um, uh, to produce the crop and to make sure that people have it available to them in the user countries. <coughs> And remember that whatever you do by way of changing the law, you're not overnight going to change the demand. And governments won't be able to gear up instantly. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect around law enforcement is there's kind of two ways of thinking about this. It's what you've got to do now while we're waiting for prohibition to be uh, abolished. And that's a matter of changing the objectives for law enforcement. Because at the moment, the objectives are pretty simple, arrest and seize putting it very simply. And that leads to a lot of arrests and seizures, but it doesn't have an impact on the drugs market. So that's the first thing we've got to do. We've got to shift towards objectives, which are basically broadly harm reduction. Um, and police have to look at reducing crime, certainly, um, reducing the violence associated with the current criminal markets, reducing the corruption, reducing the corruption of young people, reducing the harm overall. And that's quite a challenge, although there are people leading, people like David Kennedy in the, in the US, and a lot of, there's a lot of harm reduction activity. That's what we've got to do now. And then subsequently, after prohibition, we've actually got to, in a sense, re-educate police forces around the world to do what they really should do, serve and protect, and not oppress. But, but the abuse. end point of this, because it's, you know, we'll get to the politics in a minute, but if you were going to get anywhere near this, you've got, you've got to be offering a big desirable end point. I mean, how much of the crime will go, do you believe? Well, what Amanda said in the film, and by the way, the film, I mean, I'm not a film critic, but, and I know, to be fair, I know a fair bit about this topic. 
that film captured pretty much every single necessary point about the, drug, the war on drugs, which is the war on people, and, and why it's a failure. And it did it with, in my view, brilliant editing, because it kept the momentum going, even though it's packed with content. What was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> OK. That, that's all right. So you, you, you don't know the answer, I think, is, is, no, no, is the no. answer to that I'm question, not, isn't I, it? I, and I you're dodging it, so we'll move on. No, I'm not. Um, I'm not. I'm not. No, no, Chris, Chris, can I just come in on that one? Well, one of the things that, 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 that will change is, regardless of the crime, what we have is a situation where, by virtue of treating drugs as a threat, we've created an enormous threat that organised crime now um, is, is a threat to entire nation states and whole regions. Now, regardless of what happens in terms of the actual crime reduction, because we're well aware that organised crime doesn't just go and set up tea shops in, in, in nice bits of, of, of the home counties, that they will still try to ply their trade. But what you do is you take that trade away from them, which provides them with both the, 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 the money and the power to threaten entire states. That goes, okay. that stops. Very, very quickly, 50% of the money gets taken away from criminals. That has a huge impact on their ability to uh, 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 engage in crime and to corrupt and all the things that they do at the moment. And secondly, if we treated everybody who is currently committing crime to get their drugs, and under a controlled and regulated system we supplied them, we would get rid of probably 50 to 60% of the acquisitive crime in this country pretty much overnight. Caroline, um, what are the chances of mainstream political parties ever even agreeing with you, let alone <laughs> them? I think there's a chance, and I think this film would be fantastic. Basically, what we need to do is to give politicians a bit more spine, a bit more backbone. It's not an accident that people like David Cameron actually supported all of this until he actually got into, to be in a position of power to do something about it. And then he has a convenient bout of amnesia and discounts it all. So basically, politicians are cowards, and they won't go down this road unless they feel it's safe to do so. And that's why we have to show this film in every school, in every college, in every university, in every yeah, place yeah. we possibly can. Or get public opinion momentum. ahead of ahead of the politicians. But I think that people probably are already ahead of the politicians. What this film will give them is some of the ammunition and some of the facts and figures they need as well. So then you have that momentum coming from outside Parliament, which will give politicians a bit more spine. And then you need the politicians, hopefully, inside Parliament, who are pushing there as well. And it seems to me that you know, if, if politicians felt they weren't going to be punished for espousing this stuff, they'd go a lot further. So that's why we need the public to demonstrate that. But another reason that I think this, this film will have traction right now is because we as you hardly need me to tell you, are in a recession. We are in a period of austerity. We've just had another day today with George, George Osborne once again completely you know, penalising the poor for the, for the problems of the banks. Now, if, if George Osborne is looking for somewhere to find some money, then you know, he could do a cost-benefit analysis of the Misuse of Drugs Act 1972 and discover that he is spending billions and billions for absolutely no good reason whatsoever. And it might just be, and I kind of feel sad about this, but I feel it might just be the economic arguments that might push this uh, debate but, further, but given rather how than much, the, the, the actual um, evidence. Given how much pushback there's been even on marijuana, uh, and, and the counter-campaign on, well, actually, the evidence is, is flawed, there's lots of misunderstanding, you've got to look at, uh, you know, you, you, you get um, the inappropriate spectacle of sort of people who, talking about skunk, skunk who clearly don't really know what it is, and all the rest of it. I mean, how, how do you move this, you know, you're talking about a massive step change in attitudes here, aren't you? I, I think it's actually, it, it is in a way... Political a attitudes, step when, I don't mean yes, the public, I mean... But, but I, I just feel if we could get the public attitude to be more visible and more explicit, then actually it wouldn't be such a big change. If you could get that being more manifest, then I think politicians would actually say this stuff because we know they believe it. You know, it's not because all of those people in that drugs commission have drunk some kind of weird water that suddenly makes them all see the light. They know it. People know it. People now know it in Parliament. But yet, only around 24 people will have signed the early day motion I put down okay. on even just doing the Economic Analysis of Misuse of Drugs Act. So what we've got to do is make it safer for them to do that. And I'm kind of sorry about that because I would rather politicians were leading rather than following. But hey, that's the world we live in. So let's make sure that they follow in the right direction and let's get that momentum out there. Amanda, what, what would you, when people ask what will happen to drug use if you go down this road, will more people try drugs? Will more people take drugs regularly? Will more people become addicted? I, I think the evidence shows where countries have decriminalised it that use slightly drops and generally um, 
if the more draconian laws have the highest use, like UK and USA are among the highest users. So I, I don't. I think it's partly rather glamorous if it's against the law, but um, it doesn't seem. Didn't the initial numbers of people trying drugs go up? In Portugal? I think it does initially go up, but then it seems to drop down again. But I what, think, why do you think that is? Um, I think the use, the prevalence of use, it seems to have nothing to do with policy. It has to do with kind of movements of um, uh, economy and those sort of things. Richard, do you think the Portuguese experience is easily transferable? I mean, or are there cultural differences, country differences that you've got to say, well, hang on, it may not work that way here? Uh, I think the Portuguese way could be uh, transferred to the UK immediately, and it would be politically very acceptable. So I mean, that's something, you know, at the very least, that politicians in Britain can do. We, we, we decide to treat drugs as a health problem, not a criminal problem. Um, and we don't legalize, um, and that that could happen. Uh, that that could happen overnight here. It would get overwhelming public support. Um, I mean, Google Plus did a debate, uh, which, which a global debate, which had 93% of people saying um, drugs should be treated as a health problem, not a criminal problem. So that you know that 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 could be that, that would be a win-win for every single politician. Uh, nobody would need to be put in prison. Everybody can be helped. Um, and, uh, and a big, a big, a big, a big box can be ticked. Um, I suspect, I and mean, the Global Drug Commission feel that different countries should be trying different things. And you know, let's let, let, let's just get the, the the current way is not working. Let's get out and try a different thing. Um, I suspect that the uh, quite soon governments will realise that it's uh, it, it makes sense to legalise marijuana and and, and tax it um, and. You use the money from it to, uh, you know, towards education, towards health, towards helping people who actually have a problem from, you know, the small, um, you know, from drugs to get off drugs. Um, and um, but in the meantime, there's an absolute win for every single politician in Britain if they say let's treat drugs as a health problem, not a criminal problem. But one of the suggestions in the film is that if you pile money into uh, health education in the way that smoking campaigns have been. Mounted, they will in some way be more successful yeah, than will. the existing drugs campaigns. What, why do you think that? Well, look what's happened with cigarettes. I mean, the, cigarettes, the consumption of cigarettes is dropping by clever regulation. Where you know the latest law, which says you don't actually have cigarettes on on display in shops, you have them behind the counters, so people, you know, uh, don't actually see them there. But you know, they're, they're, it's, they're not prohibited, but they're you know, they're, 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 people know the dangers. They've got all the warning signs. Um, and you know something like skunk. You know, too much skunk is dangerous for you, and, and, and government should be out there warning you that skunk is far more dangerous than uh, than other forms of marijuana. And, and but why not just do all of that now? I mean, in terms of the advertising messages. They, they, I mean, do, they, do you, they, you they, think they, do you think with prohibition, those advertising messages would not work, but they that they would work in some way? I think people, if, if you legalise, you know, if there's a demand. People are going to demand using drugs. They always have changed their consciousness. They're going to continue to use it and demand it. It will go up and down. But it's much better for governments to regulate this market than throwing it all into the hands of criminals. I mean, mothers should recognize that their children are much better cared for if the governments were looking after how to regulate it. And with regulation, you can control things to a certain degree. Obviously, you'll always have some accidents, but you won't have the enormous collateral misery caused by the there's, war on drugs. Yeah, under there's prohibition, very little, you've sorry. got a real, sorry, under prohibition, you've got a real problem telling the truth about drugs. So you get Gordon Brown a few years ago and saying skunk cannabis is lethal. So every person, young person or old person, who hears the prime minister talking, am I allowed to use the word bollocks? <laughs> No, you, yeah. you can. Okay. We had a court case. We won. Say what so. you want. We're not on television. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, I mean, but you know, I do get cross about this because I mean, I have seen this at first hand, and then I listen to our leaders talking this rubbish, and then saying they're preaching and they're sending a message. And we've just had, um, you know, Jackie Smith and Gordon Brown uh, uh, trying to apologise on Radio Five Live. Not Gordon, but Jackie. I, I, I talked to um, a group of six formers recently, and I asked them what class was cannabis in, A, B, or C. They had no idea. There was no message going from the government. The government's message is that drugs will kill you, and the kids know that they won't, so they simply don't believe it. 
if you're going to prohibit drugs, you get into this ridiculous contradiction that you're saying you can't have everything because they're all bad, and you try and also give proper, truthful uh, messages. So you've got to go down the control and regulation route to give the truthful messages. So, Caroline, what, what messages would you want schools and parents to be sending out right now? On, on the one hand, you'd want them to be saying, we should decriminalise or legalise and regulate. Uh, but on the other hand, you shouldn't, take, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't buy any of it or go to the doctor for any of it. Well, I, I think you've got to be really much more accurate with our, our terminology and, and that way in which legalisation makes it sound as if you're standing outside school gates, you know, pushing drugs on people as they come out, isn't what we're talking about. And so I much prefer to talk about regulation because I think it gives a better idea. And I think that's exactly what Transform have done with their blueprint because mm. they talk about a, a variety of different ways you could regulate it. But at least, as, as Tom said, that means you would have an honest discussion with, with school kids. You wouldn't be pretending they don't exist. You wouldn't be pretending they're going to mm. die tomorrow. But you would be saying, just like you're saying about tobacco and alcohol, that these are very dangerous in, in, in large quantities. There are you know, real issues about how you get access to them. And you would give them the ammunition that they need to be able to make choices. So when my daughter never... says, are drugs bad, I should say yes. Yes? No. Is, well, it's not well, like sorry, let, I mean, is, 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 alco is alcohol is bad? Well, I would is, definitely is say yes to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's just, yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, let, let, let's just take, let's, uh, let's go back to the film one moment with Portugal. I mean, the heroin, the, you know, one of, the, one of the strongest of all drugs, effectively what Portugal have done is regulate it. And, and, and they are supplying it for free to those people who've got heroin problems. And they're supplying the needles for free to those people who've got heroin problems. And they are weaning people off the problem. And, and they've managed to reduce the amount of people on heroin by nearly 50% and the amount of aid, you know, people getting HIV by considerable amount and people no longer need to break and enter to get their fix and uh, and it's just very you know very central very logical and and if, if you go back to prohibition in America uh, all those years ago the film made it very clear that, you know, that these kinds of conversations were going on when alcohol was illegal um, you know once they made alcohol legal yes there you know there, there were people who have alcohol problems there were people who had alcohol problems when prohibition existed um, and it, uh, so, it, it, so what, what, what's, what, you know, which evil is the worst? Danny, briefly, and then I want to throw it yeah, over. Can we get the microphones out? For those people who want to find out more about how exactly we're suggesting that we could uh, control and regulate, for instance, cocaine, ecstasy, LSD, um, and, and the whole range of, of drugs that are currently available, um, we produced a book in 2009 called Blueprint for Regulation which you can download for free. Uh, and if you do, you will join half a million other people who've done that. Um, it's been a worldwide um, bestseller. It's now translated into four languages. Um, but the, the other thing, the really important thing to remember here is that we control and regulate because drugs are potentially dangerous. But, but the vast majority of people who use them use them very safely. Yeah? Most people have fun with them. Let's not forget, this isn't, the danger is that we switch this from a very pat kind of, this is a criminal issue, no, it's a health issue. It's not, it's a social issue, part of which is health. And it's definitely health for those people who are addicted and who have significant dependency issues. For the vast majority of people, it's either fun or boring. <laughs> <laughs> who, who wants to come in with a question? Yes, that hand went up first. Um, hi, fantastic film, thanks to Cosmo and Sam. Um, for me, the real culprit in the film is America. The War on Drugs is an American initiative, and it serves its domestic policy in terms of the private capital interests in the prison complex system, and it serves its foreign policy in terms of its modern imperialism. Can this argument ever really change so long as the, American have, the Americans have this policy? Or is the world strong enough? I mean, we have countries like Portugal, but is the world strong enough to lead and not follow America's lead? I mean, what is the policy in India, China, and the emerging... Yeah, because it's never, ever going to happen in America, is it? Not in our lifetimes. Richard? I, I, think, we have, I think we have to stand up um, against America, um, and it's fantastic to see South American countries standing up, finally, um, against America, um, and, uh, and, and European countries. Um, uh, uh, with they, equally, they've got to stand up against countries like Russia that are you know, amongst the absolute worst in the world. I mean, the, the HIV infections in Russia are completely out of control because of the uh, repressive uh, approach there. 
Um, and um, but but we, 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 countries have got to say you know, just got to get on and and, um, and and ignore America and get on with it. And ultimately, I think America. Um, Amanda, is that possible? Can you just ignore yes, America and I, get on? I, with it? I, I think the engine of change will come from Latin America, from the countries which are suffering most from it. And I think it's a very powerful move that it started to happen within America itself, the legalization of marijuana. And um, I, I think change is in sight. I think, you know, we've turned a certain cusp. And um, Colorado, Washington State, I mean, they both just voted the legalization of marijuana um, for medical purposes. That's a, that's a big breakthrough. And if, if countries come together and say, that they want to um, try regulation. I mean, it's amazing. Regulation has been against the UN Convention, so no country has experimented with the obvious solution, which is regulation. And, well, we've just commissioned a report to analyze how you would change the UN conventions. And if groups of country get together and decide to do so and start regulating, like Uruguay is wanting to regulate cannabis now, it will slowly start happening. And what does America do? Invade? They stop aid. But if the group of countries get strong enough... Um, I don't wanna, sorry, I don't want to pour cold water on this, but this is a kind of Western Latin American focus. Now, three cheers for Santos, President Santos of Colombia. He is the guy that everybody needs to support because he's leading, he's committed, he's going for it, and I don't think he cares what Obama or America is going to say. Obama secretly knows what he's doing is wrong, so if he's got a reason to do it, and that's Latin American countries, great. But recently there was a meeting of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast... Um, Asian uh, nations, and they recommitted themselves to a drug-free mm. Southeast Asia. Mm. Thailand looks as though it's going to have another repressive, murderous war on drugs, which is a war on people. Look at China, look at Russia, look at some of those nations. They really are, I, I was going to say, you know, behind us. Or look at Japan. Which well, been talking about you know, they're thinking in a different way, and this is a certainly strong, not even emerging economies, emerged economies, big, powerful players. So. Whilst there's great cause for optimism in some areas, that is still a massive issue. And anybody who's travelled there will know the kind of degradation that is suffered by drug users and the governments and the way they abuse them and imprison them. But there's, there's another thing here, which is, which is the position of the UK. And, and like I said earlier, the, the reason why certainly from, from where I see it, the, 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 the Latin American countries have come in now, is because their, their entire uh, states are in danger of collapse as the narcos just run through Latin America and now through West and now into East Africa. But the, 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 the wider issue here is, is the nature of the relationships between some of the developed countries uh, uh, in Europe, um, uh, some of the leading nations there, and particularly the UK. We are now in a position where virtually all of the UK media is supportive of reform, where the, the Lib Dems have had a policy very clearly uh, supportive of reform. The Green Party has a position calling for legalization and regulation um, and, and now has an MP. So that we, 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 and we are quite key in this position, uh, kind of sitting between Europe, mainland Europe and, and the US. If we move, if the Labour Party moves on this, there's a real problem here for, for, for the UK to hold a position as, as sucking up to the US as it always does in its special relationship. So if, the La if, if Ed Miliband takes the Labour Party out of the Prohibitionist Party over the next few years, there's a real crisis in the world. So that we, we shouldn't okay. underestimate what one country moves. Caroline, briefly, I mean, do, do you think this will end up being a left-right issue? Or will the sort of... The, or can you pull in the sort of the libertarians and the, and the liberals and, and get some sort of cross-party movement? I, I think you can get some cross-party movement, but I agree that, in a sense, it would take probably someone like Ed Miliband to, to, to really give that a, a, a push. And again, I come back to the point that I don't think that's inconceivable if he felt that the, that the policy environment, the wider you know, the view in, in the public, would not absolutely crucify him at the next election for doing it. And that's why I think it comes back to creating that kind of enabling culture and, and, and that kind of sense from, from people. And so we start to change around some of the opinion polls and so forth. And actually, some of them are, are pretty positive anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and get that message out okay. there to make it feel it was safer to do. Thank you very much indeed. On that note, I'm going right. to wrap it up. Thank you very much indeed Thank to you. the panel. Thank you.